My name is Hannah and I'm a teacher from Twinkle. Thanks for joining me for daily reading. This is the fourth in a series of five videos where we've been reading a story called The Man Who Bought a Mountain. Each day we're reading a chapter of the story and we're working on some reading skills. I'll be asking you some questions, so if you'd like to write your answers down, you'll need a piece of paper or use the link in the description to download an activity sheet. You can type onto the sheet or you can print it off. If you've been reading along with me so far, I'd like you to pause the video and tell someone or have a think to yourself about what you can remember about the story so far. In the story so far, we've met a boy called Yash. Yash lives on the Jagurdwa mountain and his job is to lead treks of visitors up to the base camp and back. We've met the sage who lives on the mountainside, who gives great wisdom to Yash and gives him a job to do on his way home. Then Yash met a man called Theodore J. Goldlaw, who bought the land that the mountain farmers live and work on and has promised to move the mountain to a new location. None of the villagers think that he will be able to do this, but they're concerned about the damage that will be caused through his trying. Yash has just thrown himself between a huge digger and the bamboo forest. Today we're going to read chapter four, and while we read, we're going to be learning about something called fronted adverbials. Let's get reading. Four. He stood like an insect in front of a lawnmower. Get him out of the way, Goldlaw demanded. His team of men and women in suits began to pick their way towards Yash. Some of the villagers became more animated, shouting their support for Yash. Amid shouts and waves and billowing smoke, the enormous wheels of the truck continued to roll toward him. Yash dug his feet into the dirt and clenched his jaw. What on earth do you think you're doing, Yash? called his mother as the engine revved menacingly. Yash didn't flinch. He continued to stare at the truck's driver. His mother forced her way through the gathering crowd. The enormous vehicle continued to crawl towards them, Yash planted in place, and his mother tugging desperately at his arm. Any second now they would collide. Yash pointed at Goldlaw. He hasn't met the sage! You said that he had to meet the sage before everything was agreed, he shouted. The entire village seemed to hold its breath. After a few seconds, the rumble of the surrounding machines dropped and the great bulldozer squealed to a halt. Every pair of eyes was fixed upon Goldlaw. Goldlaw frowned and pursed his lips as he looked at Yash. He surveyed the scene with his arms crossed and his legs wide apart, peering out from under his hard hat. Bubakta approached him calmly, and a moment of conversation followed. The pack of tech-wielding cronies had stopped in their tracks and turned to stare, waiting for instructions. After several more minutes of discussion, Bubakta marched from Goldlaw over to Yash. He cleared his throat. You are required to lead Mr. Goldlaw up the mountain to meet the sage. Yash couldn't believe what he was hearing. No way! I'm not walking with him again! He scowled and turned away, crossing his arms. It is your duty, Yash, the village elder replied. You are correct. The visit is required. Mr. Goldlaw has been reminded that he must meet with the sage before the deal is completed, and he has requested someone who can direct him to Guru Aluko quickly. Yash poked the toe of one worn boot into the ground, chewing over the thought. I have assured him that you are the fastest and most experienced guy that he could wish for, Babakta continued. Yash looked back over his shoulder, kicking at the stony ground, and caught Goldlaw's gaze. Every part of his big red face looked just as annoyed as Yash felt. Fine, he exhaled loudly and tramped across to where Goldlaw was standing. We meet again, boy. Not through my choice, Yash mumbled. Nor mine. Let's get this over with so that my men can get their work started. Before they could leave, a flustered-looking woman carrying a portable computer tottered over to Goldlaw and spluttered, Sir, our first detonation is planned for 2pm. Shall I cancel the order as a precaution? Goldlaw scoffed. Absolutely not. This won't take long. Continue as planned. From there, they marched, separated by several paces and a gulf of frustrated silence. Yash trudged up the winding path through the bamboo forest. 
Goldlock huffed and puffed behind, past the mountain goats and along even more narrow ridges than the tourist trail had to offer. Eventually, Yash could stand the silence no more. Why are you so determined to ruin our lives as well as our mountain? Goldlaw humphed, but did not reply. They approached a small stream with a makeshift bridge in the form of two thick planks laid over it. You'll probably fail anyway, Yash added as he stepped forwards onto it. I don't fail at anything, came the provoked response. You failed at trekking up this mountain the last time you were here. Goldlaw paused. Yash didn't know whether to expect a verbal barrage in retaliation or more of his silence. Instead, the reply was measured. Listen, son, I'm a businessman. This mountain provides a business opportunity. Clearly, other people get some kind of pleasure from climbing this thing. But out here is so hard for most people to reach. If we move it to somewhere just outside of the city, we can attract thousands, millions more tourists. We can charge admission for people to climb. It just needs to be in a more convenient place. Yash stopped in the middle of the stream and laughed. Convenient? You have no idea why people climb this mountain, and that's your problem. Does your city have a view like this one? He threw out his arms to gesture at the peaks and valleys in the distance, followed by the stream under his feet, the hanging foliage and the goats on the slopes below. Could all these animals and plants live there? Would the streams flow? The world is covered with trees and streams. In the city we can build a ski resort and hotels. We'll make our town the one to see. But this is where we live, Yash pleaded. Our farmland stretches up the mountainside. Our animals are perfectly adapted to live all around it. Whichever direction you go from here, you'll find people from my community living and working. My uncles and aunts, my cousins. There are crops that are in just the right place for them to grow. The climate and soil would be different anywhere else. This mountain brings us food, it brings us money from tourists, it brings us together. All good business decisions require a sacrifice. And what are you sacrificing? Yash cried. You can't move a mountain anyway, you must be stupid. All you're going to do is destroy our homes and land, and there's no way that the sage will agree to the deal. Actually, for this job, we have the biggest, most advanced engineering ever produced, young man. Here we will do what no one else has ever attempted. We will move this mountain. As for your wise old sage, leave him to me. Just take me there, as you were told. Ugh! Yash turned his back and stamped across the bridge, making it wobble. Goldlaw waited until Yash had reached the other side, then followed cautiously. For the rest of the journey, not one more word was spoken. Let's stop there and talk about our reading skill for today. Have a look at page 29, this sentence. Eventually, Yash could stand the silence no more. Eventually is a fronted adverbial. A fronted adverbial is something at the beginning of a sentence which adds information about how, why, or when something happens. You can remove a fronted adverbial, and the sentence should still make sense without it. Look. Yash could stand the silence no more. What extra information does eventually give us? Does it tell us why, where, or when? Pause the video now to write down what you think. Why, where, or when? Well done. Eventually tells us when the sentence happened. When did Yash lose patience? Eventually. Fronted adverbials are separated from the rest of the sentence with a comma. Take a look at one of the sentences on page 30 that we haven't read yet. In the far distance, snow-capped summits glistened in the sunlight. Can you find and underline the fronted adverbial in this sentence? It's the bit that you could take away without spoiling the meaning. Pause the video now and write down the fronted adverbial in this sentence. Well done. The fronted adverbial is the bit at the start of the sentence before the comma. In the far distance. You could remove it, and the sentence would still make sense. Snow-capped summits glistened in the sunlight. What does in the far distance tell you about the sentence? Does it tell you how, where, or when? Pause the video to write down what you think. How, where, or when? Well done. 
in the far distance tells us where the sentence is happening. Where were the summits glistening? In the far distance. Let's keep reading. As always, Yash found the sage outside his home, looking out towards the valley. Yash marched round the final bend of the steep, twisted path to his door and wheeled round to watch Goldlaw staggering up the last slope. Finally, Goldlaw heaved himself onto the rocky outcrop and paused, bent double, to draw a few deep, shuddering breaths. When he eventually regained his composure, he forced himself upright, and his jaw dropped. In the far distance, snow-capped summits glistened in the sunlight. Birds swooped effortlessly through the cool, clean air. The sky had a different blue here. You could see, almost touch the texture of the clouds, like you were actually with them, not beneath them. Huge forests lay far below, divided by great rivers, expansive lakes and miles of lush green hills. All sound had fallen away below them. The mountain towered over the land, and Goldlaw suddenly looked very small, perched upon it. Yash turned to the sage. Hey, gee, I've brought... The sage raised one thin hand. Thank you, Yashaswin. He spoke in a soothing tone. Your efforts are appreciated, as always. Welcome, Mr. Goldlaw. Goldlaw blinked and turned away from the view. His eyes seemed overly bright and his face paler. Yash stared. Welcome? But he... Please take a seat, Mr. Goldlaw. Yash Aswin, would you excuse us for a few moments? Yash crossed his arms but said nothing. After a moment he turned and trudged a little further along the path, up past the house and away from the two men. Then he waited. He kicked around in the stones for a while. He used a stick to drag lines and patterns in the dusty soil. The two men had been talking for what felt like an age, but Yash could hear nothing. He looked back down the path but could see nothing either. Stepping lightly, he crept a little closer. From above the corrugated roof of the sage's dwelling, he could make out the sound of their muffled conversation inside. On his knees, he edged closer still, holding a tree stump to keep his balance. Goldlaw's voice was getting louder. Let's stop beating around the bush. You're trying to call my bluff, aren't you, old man? You think that we can't move this mountain? Yash grinned and waited for the sage to tell him that, of course, the mountain couldn't be moved. There's no way that G would agree to this. With respect, you are wrong, Mr. Goldlaw. Ha, here we go, Yash thought. I believe that it would be perfectly possible to move this mountain to a new location. What? No, what are you saying, G? Yash's eyes widened as he broke cover. Stumbling, he clambered back down from his listening place. You can't let him, you can't! Theodore Goldlaw leaned back in a wooden chair, hands clasped behind his head and stubby legs stretched out in front of him. A satisfied grin spread over his face and he crossed his feet at the ankles. Maybe you are a wise guy after all, old man. The sage held up a pale hand to them both. Please, Yeshaswin. Mr. Goldlaw, if you'll kindly let me finish. All three of them looked at each other for a moment before the sage spoke again. His voice was as composed as ever. The mountain can indeed be moved if you have enough patience. That's all right, old man. We've got excavators and cranes. Your tools will not do the job adequately, Mr. Goldlaw. You must move the mountain one pebble at a time. You must break down the mountain into small pieces, transport the materials, and rebuild the structure elsewhere. Guffawing, Goldlaw spluttered. You've got to be kidding. One pebble at a time would take way too long. We don't have time for that. It is the only way, Mr. Goldlaw. The mountain is too great for your machines to lift. Now see here, old man. Goldlaw's smile had faded. You are looking at the man who stopped the rain in New Kathpur. The man who stemmed the flow of the Narapti River and calmed the wind in Bodar Bay. I am the man who is going to conquer this mountain. My engineers have drawn up the plans. A series of small explosions will create the necessary cracks, then we can move in with the big beasts. My machines will do the job. The sage shook his head. Beware the power of the mountain. Do not climb it so that the world can see you, but so that you can see the world. 
Goldlaw stared momentarily, then laughed so hard that he nearly fell backwards from his chair. You're as nuts as I thought you would be, old man. Living up here talking about the power of the mountain. Ha! You can keep your one pebble at a time nonsense. Goldlaw heaved his large frame out of his chair and edged around the sage to the door of the little house. But you can't, Yash blurted out. You needed the sage to agree. He hasn't agreed. He looked back impatient. Sorry, lad. I only came up here to meet the sage. That's what the agreement stated. So, now I've met him. Our work shall begin. Shielding his eyes from the bright sunlight, Goldlaw stepped out of the hut. A pleasure to meet you, Mr. Goldlaw, the sage called after him. As Yash stared, his eyes prickling at the man who had been his last hope, Guru Aluko smiled and stretched out his arm towards him, as he always did. Clutched delicately in his thin hand was the usual parcel of leaves and string. Yash reached out to take it automatically, but this time the sage grasped his hand with surprising vigour. His wrinkled fingers curled around Yash's wrist as he whispered, For the mountains will move you. That's the end of chapter four. Before we go, I'd like to take a look at one last fronted adverbial. At the end of page 33, there's a paragraph which contains three fronted adverbials. Can you underline them all? Don't forget that you should be able to cover up the fronted adverbial and the sentence should still make sense. Pause the video now and have a go. Well done. Here they are. Stepping lightly. This tells us how Yash crept a little closer, stepping lightly. From above the corrugated roof of the sage's dwelling. That's a long-fronted adverbial, but it tells us that where Yash was when he could make out the sound of their muffled conversation. He was above the corrugated roof of the sage's dwelling. Finally, on his knees is the next and final fronted adverbial. It tells us how Yash edged closer. You should have underlined everything before the first comma in every sentence. OK, that's the end of chapter four. There are more questions and activities that you can do after the video. Just download the activity sheet using the link in the description below. Join me next time for chapter five, where we'll be looking at how a character can change from the beginning to the end of a story. See you next time.